Well, good Sabbath again, everyone. It is good to be back with you. We're going to continue this week in our Outflow series sermons. We're studying Outflow in the Sabbath School lesson, and, and uh, they gave me outlines and stuff for the sermons as well. So let's go back to the fountain analogy we talked about last week. Think of a water fountain with the different levels. Steve Shogren and David Ping state that Acts verse one, chapter 1 and verse 8 describes a pattern that God uses to flow into us, and it's a pattern similar to a water fountain. This is one of those water fountains that has three tiers and a base. Now, the top level of that fountain is all about being filled through our relationship with God. And as we're constantly being filled by that relationship, it does what? It flows over outward if you will, to others. And the most natural place for this to happen is where? With our family and our friends. That's who we relate to. Well, this week we're going to talk about the next natural level of outflow, which is to the community around us. And today, especially, we're going to talk about those who are different from us. That's the focus of this week's message on extravagant love. So think, if you will, for a moment about the most extravagant thing that you've ever done. Maybe you bought a new pair of Gucci handbag or shoes or what, I don't, I don't even know all that stuff. Maybe you paid extra to have a remote start for your car so it'll be warm when you got out into the morning. Maybe you got the latest and greatest iPhone. Hopefully it wasn't one of those that blew up on you. Or some other high-tech gadget. Still others, it may be a fishing boat or an extra special vacation cruise. I know I did the fishing boat thing one time. Talk about a hole in the water you pour your money into. I don't think Brenda's ever going to let me live that one down. However, extravagant is a relative word, especially if you're as rich as a rock star. Now, according to a 2005 article on Blender.com, the following are some documented dumbest rock star extravagances. Did you know that Britney Spears will only allow her hair to be cut with a pair of clippers that are imported from Japan that cost $3,000? Will Smith... I don't know... Will Smith, you know, MIB and Independence Day, so on and so forth, he apparently has enough leftover cash that he shells out $2,500 a month to Caesar Milan, a.k.a. the Dog Whisperer, to provide canine counseling to his four Rottweilers. And then we have, while unpacking for a concert in Italy, U2's Bono realized he had forgotten his favorite hat. Now, to prevent it from being crushed as he had it sent to him, he spent $1,700 to have it flown from London via British Airways in a first-class seat. And this is not just with the new rock stars. Beatle John Lennon paid nearly $13,000 to rent the entire first-class cabin of a jetliner so that he and his son Sean could set up their model train during the flight. It's reported that Elton John spends around $250,000 a year for fresh-cut flowers. In the summer of 2003, rapper P. Diddy rented a 181-foot-long yacht with an onboard gym, gold-plated taps in the jacuzzis, and a helicopter pad. His two-and-a-half-week vacation rental cost $800,000. Talk about having money to burn. In 1994, British pop duo KLF piled 20,000 50-pound notes, that's about 1.7 million American dollars, 
onto a bonfire and lit it. Extravagant? In 2003, Justin Timberlake paid $1,700,000 to be able to have a one-day private Christmas shopping spree at London's famous Harrods with him and some of his friends. And then we have Stanley Burrell, a.k.a. M.C. Hammer, who squandered a $30 million fortune on mansions, luxury cars, and nonstop partying. And in six years, he was bankrupt and $13,700,000 in debt. Extravagant. On a far different level than we can comprehend. But even so, extravagance is not all bad. Did you know that Jesus promises us abundant, overflowing life in John 10 and verse 10? He's talking about a lifestyle that's so extravagant in spiritual power and generosity that people can't help noticing. You think people noticed what those rock stars were doing? Of course they did. They even put it on a website. And Jesus is saying that he is going to give us such spiritual extravagance, spiritual power and generosity that people are going to notice. But unfortunately, there's a lot of religious people living a form of Christianity similar to what is described in Victor Hugo's book, Les Miserables, as a dry happiness. An existence characterized by emptiness and lack of purpose and fulfillment. So folks, God wants us to be extravagant in seeking his lost sheep. Amen? Amen? If you don't think so, turn with me to our passage today, Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. And if you read this, the very first verse says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near Jesus to hear him. This made the Pharisees and scribes grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Anybody see anything with that? They're upset that Jesus is spending time with not just Sinners, but uh, if you read there, they had a whole separate category for tax collectors. <laughs> so from the Pharisees' point of view, by associating with tax collectors and other notorious sinners, Jesus was violating Psalm 1 and verse 1. Anybody quote that? Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with mockers. You see, the Pharisees seem to interpret this verse to mean that anyone who is walking, standing, or sitting even near sinners or even folks who are compassionate and reaching out to them is committing a sin. And this kind of thinking we know of as today is called what? Guilt by association. See, you know what I'm talking about. And it's obviously not what the verse says. Because a shepherd might spend all day with his flock, but that doesn't make him a sheep, does it? <laughs> or as Steve Green used to say, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Keith Green. Jesus went on to tell three stories in the following passages that may have been intended to help both them and us see the error of the Pharisees' compassionless thinking. And from these parables, they reveal a God who consistently demonstrates an extravagant compassion for us, his lost sheep. So if we read on in Luke 15, 4 through 6, we find the parable of the lost sheep. So Jesus told them this parable, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he found, finds it? 
And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls all his friends together and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one center, sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Hmm. Now I have to ask you this. If you go back and look at this parable, set aside the spirituality of it a minute, and let's just use common logic. I work in a business world in addition to being a pastor, so I'm going to put on my business mind. Let's do the math. If a sheep is worth, say, 100 bucks, does it really make sense to risk $9,900 in livestock to predators? Because if you remember when we read that, where did he leave his sheep? He left the 99 where? Out in the middle of the field. He didn't take them home and put them in the barn. He left them right where they were. Does it make sense to leave them like that for one $100 sheep? Not from a business standpoint. Now let's set those monetary considerations aside. Searching for this sheep could cause the shepherd to get lost or hurt in the wilderness. Far from help, no cell phone. So why would anyone risk his or her life for a sheep? Just one. Doesn't make much sense from a business standpoint. But I'm here to tell you, it is the nature of caring to take extravagant risks. Something about caring causes us to discount that risk and do it anyway. So what was Jesus' real point in the parable? Well, maybe Jesus was asking, do you Pharisees, or in our case, you church-going folk, do you really care about people out there? Or are you just focusing on yourselves? So what about it? Do you truly believe there are people in your community who are lost and in spiritual danger? There's an ancient Middle Eastern proverb that says, A heart that loves finds a thousand ways. A heart that doesn't finds a thousand excuses. God wants us to rejoice in every lost person's return to Him. Amen? That's what it says here. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous folks who do not need to repent. God gets excited when a lost sheep comes back into the fold. And we should too. Let's go on. 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I found the coin I lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now this parable allows us to understand the great joy that God feels every time one lost person comes back to Him. Now it's possible that Jesus' choice of a shepherd and a woman as the heroes in these two parables may have been Him tweaking the Pharisee's nose just a little bit. Remember how this chapter started? They were a little upset. He was with tax collectors and sinners. They're kind of looking down on Him, condescending. He just reached up and went, Dick. You say, why is that, Pastor? Because in the Pharisees' worldview, shepherds were so despised and considered so unclean, they were banned from both the temple and the synagogue. They stunk too bad. Might as well have been a pig farmer. They were nasty. They were ruffians out in the field. They were rough, gruff. And as far as women were concerned, most Pharisees began each day with a prayer called the Bracha. They were thanking God for not creating them as heathens, slaves, or women. 
Now, it must have stung to have Jesus have a shepherd and a woman's attitude held up as more virtuous and closer to God than the Pharisees. If they weren't ticked off with him before, he definitely got in their comfort zone then. But both the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin highlight the need to put genuine, natural caring into a practical action. But they also highlight the joy God wants us to feel in helping people turn toward God, even when those people are nothing like us. This is where true joy comes from. The richness and fulfillment that we will never know if we remain in a state of dry happiness. Now that coin that was mentioned in the verse is a Greek drachma is worth roughly a day's wages. So, if you had, even if you had five days wages in the bank, wouldn't you put some energy in looking through the couch cushions for one day's lost wages? Anybody? Well, I've taped one day's wages and cash under the, one of the seats that you're sitting in. True story. So everyone take a moment and reach under your chair and see if there's an envelope with cash in it and shout out when you find it. <laughs> Woohoo! Somebody found it. Well, come on down. <laughs> Woohoo! That's right. <laughs> All right, everybody give her an applause. She found a day's wages. Open it up, prove it to them. It is a funky envelope. How much is there? $200. So a day's wages, right? Thank you. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Thank you so much for finding it for me. I was hunting all over for it. Now, Accept a kiss from me. Thank you so much for your help. <laughs> and to those of you listening online, it was a Hershey's kiss. <laughs> That's a fact. But the point of the story, just in the same way that we would be so excited to find a day's wages that we had lost so too is God so excited about the return of every single one of his lost sheep and the lost coins that he wants us to throw a party here every single Sabbath. And like the shepherd who found his sheep and the woman who retrieved a lost coin, we can share in the excitement by inviting the lost people in our community to come over here to church and help us celebrate. Not one. Amen. Let me say it again. <laughs> Just like the shepherd who found his sheep and the woman who retrieved the lost coin, we can share that excitement by inviting the lost people of our community to help us celebrate. Amen. Thank you. Now our music, our singing, the celebration we have at church every Sabbath is an extension of that same party the shepherd and the woman held. And there's only one way to get in that party. You have to be a lost sheep or a recovering lost sheep. I guess you could say the party is an important part of God's Lost Sheep Anonymous program. As a recovering lost sheep, when I come up front to give you a message, I should begin by saying, Hi, I'm Shay Rancorn, and I'm a lost sheep. <laughs> After all, we're here to celebrate the extravagant love of our shepherd who risked everything and even suffered death to bring us home. Folks, God wants us to embrace his vision for our community. Turn, turn on to Luke 15. Now we'll go to verses 11 through 32. Where we find that God desires to see his extravagant love and compassion flowing out of the church and into the community. Here we have the parable of the prodigal son. 
was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And so the father divided his property between them, and not many days later the younger son gathered everything he had gotten and took a journey into the far country. And there, much like the rock stars we talked about, he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and got a job with one of the citizens in that country who sent him in the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the slop that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said, Now how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, and here I am starving to death? I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called one of your sons, so treat me as one of your hired servants. So he arose and came to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he felt compassion. And he ran to him. And he embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm not worthy any longer to be called your son. The father just ignored him and turned to his servants and said, Run, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand so everyone will know that he's my son. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For my son was lost and is now found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came, he drew near the house, and he heard the music and the dancing, and asked one of the servants what was going on. And his servant said, Your brother's come home, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he's back safe and sound. But the son was angry, and he refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and entreated him. He said, Come in with us. Let's celebrate. Your brother's here. And he looked at him. He said, Dad... I have served you all these years. I've never disobeyed anything you commanded me to do. But you never gave me a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this good-for-nothing son of yours comes home who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father replied, Son, you're always with me, and everything that I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Folks, God desires to see his extravagant love and compassion flowing out of this church into our community. You see, when the younger son demanded his inheritance early, he displayed a selfishness that was not only arrogant but hurtful. He wasn't going to wait for his daddy to die and then take care of it. He wanted it now. That was nothing but pure selfishness. And according to Isaiah 53 and verse 6, six all we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way. So every human being except Jesus has been just like the prodigal son and turned away from the heavenly father, essentially telling him, I'm doing my own thing later. prodigal son was recklessly extravagant, right? Not too unlike M.C. Hammer, who began his career as a gospel rapper in a group called the Holy Ghost Boys. But then he turned his attention to fast cars, fast women, fast race horses, and a bunch of fast friends. And he did this for six years with amazing gusto until his money and fame dried up. You see, circumstances... And the Holy Spirit worked to awaken a hunger within us. Isaiah 55 and verse 2 gets to the heart of the issue by asking, Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? And why pay for food that does you no good? You see, folks, apart from the Father, all the quote-unquote things we thought would make us happy and fulfilled eventually turn out to be fleeting and empty. 
I spoke about that a few weeks back about Benjamin and how he learned that and thinking that he really wanted a certain toy or something and saving up his money. He said, Dad, less than three days after I get it, I wonder why did I want that so bad? Because it doesn't meet that need. You see, whenever we stray from the Father, the Holy Spirit continues to remind us of God's kindness. He whispers to us, listen to me, and you can eat what is good and fulfilling. Now while it may be tempting to join the Pharisees and justly condemn people's immorality, people's foolishness, goodness knows there's enough on the news and Facebook today, it'd be easy to take that Pharisaical position, wouldn't it? Come on now, and righteously so. There's a bunch of garbage going on. I swear, I think a lot of people have taken logic and put it on a shelf and gone out and lived totally by emotion. But the point here is that we can either be like the Pharisees, and even though it's just to condemn other people's morality and foolish, it's wrong. Because we must remember that in Romans 2 and verse 4, we're told how wonderfully kind tolerant and patient God is with all of us. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. And just as in this parable where the prodigal son's father's kindness and willingness to forgive him drew him home, I'm happy to tell you that the same is true for MC Hammer. He turned back to God too. He finally realized, just like the prodigal son, that his worldly success had drawn him further and further away from family, from true contentment, and even from God. If you remember, he said, I've sinned against God and you, Father. So our struggle, our struggle after reading these passages is to change our hearts from the kind of judgment demonstrated by the Pharisees to the kindness shown by the Father in this passage. I know that I've struggled with that this week myself. But if we do so, we'll remove many of the barriers that are within us preventing lost sons and daughters from coming home. You see, in the verses 20 through 24, we saw the Father. What, did you notice what He was doing? He was looking. He was out watching hoping, searching the horizon that his son would return, praying for it. I believe the father in this passage was practicing a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. You know, that kind of love that is patient and kind, that's not jealous or proud, that does not demand any terms be met, not irritable, keeps no record of wrongs, and rejoices when the truth wins out. But most of all, it never gives up. Never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So what about you? Are you hoping for and believing the best of those around you who are not yet Christians? How does your mindset about them today? Are you hoping and praying that these people will come to know Christ as you show them patience, respect, and practical love? I told you I'd get on your toes. Or have you given up on the people around you assuming they'll never come to Jesus? Have you given up on that homeless man that's there at the intersection each day holding up his little cardboard sign will work for food. Well, what about if you're like me and you're walking through Food City yesterday and you see folks so covered in tattoos that you couldn't see their natural born skin? And it's not the first time you've seen them. And instead of looking at them with the Father's eyes, with compassion, looking past their skin regardless of what color it originally was or is today, and looking into their heart, 
like the father was in this parable, saying, come home to Jesus. I don't care what choices you've made, good, bad, or otherwise. Come home to Jesus. Tattoo, no tattoo, funny haircut, no funny haircut, stinky, clean, rich, poor, none of that matters. Because if we can look at them with the Father's eyes, with His extravagant love that He showers on us each and every day, none of that matters. Because all we're after is their heart. In our parable, we see the Father live filled with love and compassion. He, run, he doesn't just go to his son and shake his hand or say, Hey, I'm glad you're back home. He runs toward him and he embraces him and kisses his son. You see, folks, God's love as described in 1 Corinthians 13 is really the only thing we have going for us. TV evangelists, Bible tracts, Christian books, they're fine. But the parable, this story of the prodigal son makes it clear the only power that can really draw someone to feel the Father's loving embrace is when we embrace them and make them feel safe regardless of how different they may be from us. You see, the Father not only accepted his son, he also demonstrated extravagant respect for him. Did you notice he didn't grudgingly allow his son back like a criminal on probation? Okay, we'll let you be a servant if you can handle that. He honored him with the finest robe in the house. He gave him a ring to show that his son was restored to the status of the honored second son. He put sandals on his feet. And he killed the fatted calf. My son didn't deserve any of this, did he? But his father's forgiveness, just like his father's joy, was extravagant. And then in the end of this passage, verses 25 through 30, we can see the older brother's response, right? Think maybe he's tweaking the Pharisee's nose again? Yet many churchgoers today act the same by looking down on people outside of their people and saying, glad I'm not like one of them. And unfortunately, the more quote-unquote biblical that we view ourselves, the stronger the us versus them attitude tends to be. But folks, this attitude of the older son is not biblical. In fact, it's the polar opposite of the extravagant love towards which Jesus not only showed us, but he's calling us to show to others. His extravagant love naturally flowing out of us because of the extravagant love that is flowing into us. It's the natural outflow of his extravagant love. Now, extravagant love sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Jesus is calling on us to offer the people in our community a level of friendship, authenticity, and transparency that is not natural for us. Anybody feel like that might get them out of their comfort zone? You're not alone. In fact, on our own, would you not agree with me, we're naturally more like the angry older brother than the extraordinarily generous father. But Jesus doesn't want us to fake it. People aren't stupid. They're sensitive to the little things that reveal how we really feel about them. But the good news is that the everything the father has is ours, just like he told the older son. Even his extraordinarily extravagant love. Everything the Father has is ours. Even God's extraordinarily extravagant love for lost people. You say, well, I'm not wired like that. Sure you are. You just got to let it flow out. 
God says, I've already given this extravagant love to you. I've shown you what it is. Spend time with me and let me fill you with that and it will naturally flow out in every single circumstance you find yourself in wherever you are each and every day. If we ask, seek, and knock, Jesus will fill our hearts with His kind of love. When it comes to outreach, asking usually means praying for a compassion that we don't usually have. Seeking usually means looking for opportunities to serve people that we wouldn't normally even notice. And knocking means touching people's lives in a practical way. You see, folks, every human being is valuable. And Jesus is telling us something important in these three stories about the shepherd's lost sheep, the woman's lost coin, and the father's lost son. Now, one of the authors of this story, this uh, series we're on, Steve Shogren, he tells how God taught this message to him while at a drive through one day. Now, he was frustrated with trying to get his church to reach out to the community, and he realized that he was hungry, so he went to Taco Bell, the drive through for something to eat. If you study any of his series, you can see he likes burritos. Now, in the silence between shouting his order in the microphone and driving up to the window, God spoke to Steve. Now, it wasn't an audible voice, but he says it was a barely imperceptible mental whisper. Steve, God said, open your door. I have a present for you. He said, I felt a little silly. I didn't know if it was God or just maybe I didn't get enough sleep or had some weird breakfast, but he said, I stopped the car and I opened the door and looked down on the ground. And ground into the pavement below was a scarred and tarnished penny. Gee, thanks, was a sarcastic thought that came to mind as he reached down and pried the practically worthless coin from the asphalt. But then God spoke again. He said, in the world's eyes, a lot of people in the community you are trying to reach are just like this penny. They're flawed, imperfect, and forgotten. Even churches don't see much value in wasting time on them. And through some eyes, they may look shabby and worthless. But to me, they're just like you, Steve. They're precious beyond measure. With tears streaming down his face, Steve drove home with that penny, a bag of burritos, and a whole new understanding of the incredible extravagant value God places on the broken, bothersome, infuriating people we all are. It's a funny thing, Steve remarked several weeks after this happened. Since that Monday morning, as I've been tempted to get angry or blow people off with a few brief words, I'll look down on the ground and there will be another penny. I keep a whole stack of them on my desk now to remind me of God's extravagantly generous heart and the special calling he's placed on my life. So as we close, I'd like to invite you to pray a prayer with me. If you would, let's bow our heads and pray it together. Jesus, here we are again. Please fill us up with your living water and make your life flow out of this place. Please pour your Holy Spirit into our lives lives. and help us to find every precious lost coin. coin. Each one of us here is surrounded by people you want to call home. home. Let your extravagant love pour out through us to them. In Jesus' name, name. amen.